We heard about Richard August because he was all over the news as the man who was sharing his Manhattan penthouse with 1,200 turtles, most of them endangered. It was the kind of fantastic story that New Yorkers love because it proves that everything and anything is always happening somewhere in this city. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Discovery. Reporters from around the world flooded in, asked him their questions, and sent out into the world his strange situation. But the press had painted a rather one-dimensional portrait. It seemed that Richard's efforts deserved more serious attention. Not more two-minute stories, but more grit and less gossip. So drawn to something untold, we tracked him down and found him here, at his home, buried in this right-angled jungle. All we knew was what the news had told us that 10 years ago, Richard was a writer, eating dinner in a restaurant in Chinatown when he saw a diamondback terrapin in a tank with eels. He bought her for $20. They were about to take her back to the kitchen to chop her up, but Richard stopped them, took her home, bought a tank, placed her in it, and named her the Empress. And then slowly, his empire began to grow. Then in the late 90s, Richard and other turtle keepers were exposed to a videotape that had been recently shot in the food markets in China. The footage devastated them. Not only was it terribly brutal, but again and again the turtle keepers were able to identify many, many endangered and critically endangered species amongst the more common species. And they calculated that 30,000 turtles were being bought daily in the food markets, and that every turtle regardless of its endangered status, was bound for the soup pot. The footage galvanized Richard and other turtle keepers into a frenzy of acquisition. Richard purchased hundreds of animals, including 13 critically endangered species. And in a few years, he became a major player in the turtle conservation world having acquired the largest genetic population of several of the world's most critically endangered species. And that was the story. But as we began filming, we soon became aware that Richard's operation was coming apart at the seams. His passionate pastime had swollen into an exhausting enterprise. His resources were diminishing, his finances were dwindling, and his art his abandoned writings, and all the remnants of his prior life were collecting dust in a storage space in New Jersey. We realized that we had begun filming during a period of crisis. Richard was building an ark, or as conservationists today would call it, a group of assurance colonies.
Richard was rescuing animals from extinction, assembling them by species, and trying to create, if possible, conditions in which they might breed and defy their disappearance. For Richard's assurance colonies to succeed, his animals would need two things, time and shelter. But slowly, Richard's ark was sinking, though the shore, he told us, was in sight. So he took us to New Jersey and showed us his solution. Um, my situation's not at all unique. It's, my situation is, is the same for all the large private collectors, that at some point we can no longer hold on to and maintain our collections. We can keep passing them off to each other, but there's a limit to how long we can keep passing 200 or 500 or 1,000 animals off to our group of friends. There has to be a place where their conservation potential can be can be maintained and held together, and where other animals of the same species will also be come together so that we can do long-term population management so that we have enough animals, enough founders, to actually be able to breed the animals responsibly for the next 50 to 100 years. I realized I'd either have to sell the animals or create an institute. So this is it. That's the future home of the Tewksbury Institute of Herpetology. It's going to be the largest freshwater turtle and tortoise conservation program in the country, probably in the world. We're going to have my collection, there are eight or nine other private collections which will slowly be bringing their animals here. We expect we're going to have two to three thousand animals here within the next year. So I want this institute, I would like to be able to sort of step back a little bit and develop the ideas and put together the people and help raise the money. I need to have other people involved for the animal's sake and also for my own sake so that I can go back to my life because this is now consuming. I mean, I've spent years now doing nothing else except try to manage and maneuver this collection to safe harbor. Um, it's, it's just taken over, it's taken over my life. But before construction could begin in New Jersey, Richard was forced out of his apartment in New York. For a while, Richard had been the only tenant in the new building, but now the building was fully occupied and Richard's neighbors didn't care for his venture. So with legal threats, they pressured him to move out. You know, and the truck is the back of the truck. Is so cool. how, many, how many more is there? Mm -hmm. I think we could get three. Creatively, maybe four, but I don't think we could get six. Okay, so let's do the, um, let's grab these guys.
Richard's turtles and tanks filled 30 trucks, and after three months, he was still in the final stages of moving out. We had planned to join him on his trip to a turtle conference in Florida, but he was too busy to attend, so we went without him. <clears throat> Welcome to the second annual TSA conference, and I'm really happy to see this many people here. Judging from the extraordinary display of Mother Nature over the last couple of days, I'm just delighted to see anyone here. In January 2001, and many of you were at that meeting in Fort Worth, we came together and committed ourselves to preventing turtle extinctions. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for all you do for turtles, and have a great conference. It amazes me how little people still know um, about what's going on and the plight of these animals face. Even people within the zoo, keystone species, obligatory relationships, people in the zoo, the aquariums don't know about it. It's very well documented. And some horses may even play key roles in the world of transportation seeds. I know the 25 turtle species that are currently in Florida, as well as species worldwide, are now in decline. The world is facing a global turtle survival crisis of unprecedented proportions. And just one thing to bear in mind, this is one of the 25 turtles on death row, completely out of control, but it's in dangerous status. But it's not an endangered species. It's not an endangered genus. It's an endangered family. I've had a lifelong interest in turtles, but uh, nothing really prepared me for what I faced when I arrived in Vietnam in 1996 and witnessed the literally tons of turtles uh, heading north up Highway 1 across the border to China. Undoubtedly, populations are declining throughout the country. It's, it's really amazing how fast this trade is progressing. That just, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to, uh, to express adequately what's going on because it's just, just People are going into areas and just stripping the you know entire regions of their uh, of their turtles and tortoises. The fact that uh, what I would like to call the, the sort of the ecological fabric is coming apart in these small. In the late 90s countries. in Southeast Asia alone, this trade was measured at over 15,000 tons annually, and this and this never ends. It, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So what can we do, and what have we done to help overcome this threat? Construction of Richard's Institute had yet to begin, so he rented a warehouse in New Jersey to temporarily house his animals until the Institute was finished and ready. Uh, all right, so, Laura, let's figure out what we're doing, okay? Who goes where? Pseudo, the tortoise is coming out straight through the middle. And let's get the king north. These other things all sort of congregate. Those guys should go. We have the babies in the other room. Depressa. Let's get the depressa out in this section that takes the hard. That place sort of to the Susan, have you looked at our other counties, how beautiful these are? Yeah. Another shipment of confiscated turtles arrived from the food markets in China. How can we certify check? We just 
got our freight charges due. The live animals. Fish and Wildlife is inside, looking at our shipment. They won't let um, us stand with them while they open it up right now. They're inspecting the shipment to see that it's properly crated. The animals which are in it are the ones which are in it, that are on the invoice, so we're not you know, sneaking in something else or different numbers. That the animals are above the legal size, can't import animals under four inches. So it should be okay. Oh my God. These are the first difficult tortoise I ever had. These are the ones none of us could keep alive a few years ago. There are almost none in captivity. They're from Vietnam. Jesus. Aren't they amazing? Yeah. I mean, he could be six weeks without water, you know, or food. No, just over there in the markets, and they take him out of the forest. He's in the village. He's moving around. Nobody's feeding them. Nobody's watering them. They're not interested in that part of it. He was destined for food. Richard's plans for the Institute were developing quickly. He'd gathered support of all kinds. He'd put together a dream team of turtle experts to serve as his board of directors. And on this day, he was showing the site to a group of future volunteers. Not only would Richard's Institute house thousands of turtles, but it would serve as a major center for turtle research and education. Already, Richard had developed cooperative programs with schools and students in America and abroad. The scope was enormous. The Institute would encompass every feasible phase of conservation and bring together the many dispersed efforts of turtle keepers around the country. Here, the assurance colonies would have a chance to succeed. Construction was set to begin. A friend's family owned the property and had offered Richard use of their land. But at the last minute, due to undisclosed reasons, the property fell through. Richard and his turtles were now stranded at the rented warehouse in New Jersey.
Richard's collection had grown to 1,600 animals. He was spending three hours a day commuting between New York and New Jersey. He had declared bankruptcy. He decided the most sensible thing to do was pitch a tent and sleep in the cornfield beside the warehouse. There, uh, there was kind of this whole sort of sea change in terms of where we're ultimately going to be and how we're ultimately going to be. And one factor that's affecting everything right now is money, which is, um, I mean, I'm at deeply at the end of my um, ability to keep supporting this. And we totally need over the next four weeks to determine whether or not someone's going to come on board and, and infuse us with cash. The alternative is to sell off all the animals. But I don't think any of us know what kind of an impact these sorts of assurance colonies really will have long term on the fate of any species. There are very few projects in the world which one can point to and say that project saved that species. I mean, what, right now, what's happening is um, I'm out here, we just finished moving, and I'm out here and I'm sleeping in the tent, and um, we're trying to get the animals better organized here so at least they can survive um, and not die of stress and overcrowding um, until we can resolve the issue of whether or not we're going to survive. People burn out under the weight of these collections, um, each in their own ways, and whether because somebody gets sick or there's financial hardship or a family member dies or you have to move or there's a divorce. Or, but something like that happens and um, the stress of that just makes it impossible to maintain these huge collections and maintain one's life at all and my life is in shambles. Um, I mean, just total shambles. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm bitterly depressed in the mornings and, um, you know, just not in a good place. Somewhere in the next six weeks, I'm going to decide what, what's going to happen here. Richard had to completely empty his old apartment before it could be shown to potential buyers, so he returned one more time. Half of the deaths are from keeper error. Just lack of attention and stupidity. And then half of them are conditions you can't do anything about.
Richard spent the next month searching for the two things that could revitalize the project. First, serious fundraising help, and second, a new site for the Institute. He found both. We just put a bid on this property. I think what happened in the interim was that uh, some key people told us that this was an eminently fundable organization if we could hang it out for, you know, a year or two. And I couldn't bring myself, I couldn't bring myself to spending the next three or four months selling off the animals emotionally. I just couldn't bring myself to it. Um, it seemed that that would be just too difficult and I would feel too um, devastated about myself at the end of it and having spent five years doing this and then trashing it. So, and that really there is, you know, a probability that um, this can be made to work. If we're going to make this go, we need to have a permanent site. And we can't really fundraise without a permanent place and a place to say, that's where the greenhouse is going to go, this is where the turtles are, this is the institute. What I love about this is that it, it's so massive, it's these buildings back here are so unnecessarily grand in what they were designed for that one has the feeling of a big institute, of a, of a big operation, that it has scope to it, and that just is sort of embedded in the site. And I think that's really good for what we want to do. I mean, I think I can get, in a sense, freer of this by having it turn out successful than by tanking it. So if we're lucky, this would be the largest turtle and tortoise conservation facility in the country in another six months. Just might be possible. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel, um, more settled, and, um, what was so agonizing is, you know, having to, to make the decision, not know which it's going to be, and I think once the, the decision's made, one's more at peace. I mean, I'm scared to death altogether, just in general, day to day. I still don't have my life in New York set up. Um, there's a lot of work here. I just, I mean, I, I'm hoping that this will be a way to ease out this heavy burden and not just become an enormous burden. Um, so that's really sufficiently terrifying. Um, but I don't know. If anything's going to work, it's going to work here. And if it doesn't work here, then it wasn't going to work. New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection visited Richard's warehouse for an inspection. They found his facility in violation of several environmental state codes. A shipment of confiscated turtles from Hong Kong was on the way to JFK Airport. While Richard waited in the parking lot for the wildlife broker, he received a call from his lawyer. They discussed the grievances filed by the New Jersey DEP. 
and Richard explained, point by point, how he had remedied the DEP's complaints. They spoke for an hour, confirming a truth we'd been learning for months, that conservation today is the unrelenting battle of compromise between procedure and passion, fought with words, dollars, and cell phones. This is basically fish and wildlife not understanding what's involved with um, conservation of these turtles. No animals that come into a facility, that come out of the wild and are exposed to other species are supposed to be released back into the wild. You know, we don't have a bunch of diseased animals. We do have sick animals that are under treatment. Um, but that's the nature of the game. That's what we don't know. I mean, these animals can be that big or they could be juvenile. So, I mean, that's the animals we get frequently are animals that would cost five or ten dollars over there for a meal. But by the time, if they come through middlemen, we have to purchase them. We might be spending a thousand dollars by the time they get here. And that's just so, yeah, so dwarfing. I mean, you know, spending tens of thousands of dollars on a handful, a thousand animals that you keep. Between all of us, we might have 10, 12,000 animals in this country. Um, that's one day yeah. at a market, at one market. <laughs> one day, and we're spending every resource, every zoo's tapped out. These are wild animals. So, I'm so curious, I wanna see what's going on. They're not allowing them in. <laughs> They're not allowing them in? Ridiculous. Well, the shipment's not being allowed into the country by Fish and Wildlife. Right now they're going to um, keep the animals overnight and they're going back at nine o'clock tomorrow morning and I'm giving them some heat packs I don't know they, they, I think Nick they said they're not even gonna call Washington right until oh they, they are. oh they are calling are they calling now nothing anyone can do and then you can appeal the decision or something if you need to yeah that's that is the question. China Airlines isn't going to ship them without payment. They're not at fault. Um, you know, we barely had the money to bring them in. Um, if what happens if nobody pays for it? They just get euthanized. And who's going to do that? I'm just running through various permutations, but the only question I had in, um, is what happens if there's no money to ship them back? Good. Richard and his colleagues refused to pay for the turtle's return to China. It took three days for Richard to negotiate and win custody of the turtles. Finally, on the night of the presidential election, we headed to New York's Fish and Wildlife Department to pick them up. Yeah, so, I mean, it's kind of hysterical, I think, what, what happened was, um, the backstory seems to be soft. The United States has been aggravated for several years that China's exporting inexpensive socks to the United States. And um, we put a quota on the socks uh, a few weeks ago, and China responded with some kind of a tariff trade restriction on U.S. exports, and the United States retaliated um, more or less last Thursday by not letting anything into the country from China and sending them all back, more or less. Hello? Hey. Hey. Hi. Right. Yeah. Right. We're gonna uh, roll not this door. So Fine. Out here. Okay. Great. All right.
Richard was legally forbidden from bringing any more turtles across the border into New Jersey. He had nowhere else to unpack the animals, clean them up, and hydrate them, so we invited him to use the producer's apartment in Queens. Richard was unable to satisfy the demands of New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection, so they ordered him to remove his turtles from the state within 90 days. Optimistic that he could eventually appeal the DEP's eviction order, Richard moved forward with his plans to build the Institute, as intended, in New Jersey. So that's an issue, because it's you know, October and it's two months since the point where I said that if we don't have funding, we're going to die, and um, we still don't have funding, and in a sense we're no closer to it than we ever were, so we're a little more organized. But, I mean, right now, I'm trying to turn all of my attention to fundraising and just not be mired down in day-to-day -day operations just try to fundraise because that doesn't come across and everything is sort of deeply fucked.
Look who's in here. Oh my God. I've never seen one before. This must be a tree frog. He is so beautiful. Uh, let me launch into it. Well, um, I'm kind of in a crosshairs. We have this, this institute with, um, you know, the, it's by now it's the largest group of endangered turtles and tortoises in the country. I mean, we have five species that are extinct in the wild. We have the largest holdings of half of the critically endangered turtles and tortoises in the world. What this is called is an assurance colony. And we have the basis for, you know, the major turtle and tortoise facility in the country. I've had to move out of New York. We're in the country. Um, and it's draining me financially in a, like in a deadly way. You know, the last five years between the litigation and moving nine times and everything has just been um, just, you know, a devastation. We're about to buy a piece of property, a farm here. We're in a rental right now, which will be a home base. My bankruptcy attorney is telling me, you're going to kill yourself. Your handwriting's on the wall. You're destroying yourself. And I'm, I don't have a, I don't, I, I don't, I've been homeless for two years. Um, five years ago, I was deep in, you know, in sort of the major writing project of my life, and it, deep into it, and it was, it really had its its shape and character. And the fucking ceiling fell in, and you know, thousands of gallons of water. And then I started relocating, and I've, it hasn't stopped. I've also managed to isolate myself socially pretty effectively and then I just withdrew into work yes that's where I sleep I sleep on the floor at her house remember her place yeah I sleep on the floor I mean it's 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 as pathetic as it sounds I'm not even sure what exactly it is I'm asking Elaine I'm just reaching out you know okay Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye. As I get older and think about my childhood, um, 
the parts of my childhood which I used to complain the most bitterly about, I now see have contributed to um, my capacity for action or addressing the world in certain ways or being sensitized for better or for worse to different aspects of the world. I know it would have been good or not to have had more of certain kinds of attention from my parents when I was younger, for instance. Um, you know, um, all the bad things seem to, when you compensate for what seems like the bad things as you get older, then a whole bunch of creative stuff comes out of trying to make up for what didn't happen or what did happen. So just looking at my present adult life, I just, I don't know. I, I would be hesitant to make a judgment. I keep thinking that if the Institute gets pulled off, then there will be a kind of um, glorious resolution and transformation of the, the many different personal motives which went into this. There uh, seems to be a feeling in people that if the wild is gone, then just let them go with the wild, but let them die in freedom. Um, just let the whole thing go. That's something which it feels good to um, hold. It has a kind of a, a noble, romantic, tragic pathos to it that's very sensitive to life. and. I've parted ways from that, and part of that is my own tremendous desire to hold and possess and draw the life close to me. So maybe what we're doing is we're all just, you know, amusing ourselves, hoping to be doing something of, um, of merit, but one thing is that Okay, so maybe none of the animals that we have here will survive and will in any significant way contribute to the continuation of their species, but maybe what they will do is they will spark um, some students, some young researchers or some other people who come through and those people in turn will do something else and that else is what will make the difference. After weeks of waiting, Richard's bid on the new property was finally accepted and a contract was prepared. After two years of envisioning, planning, and struggling, everything was in place, but he still had to win his appeal against the DEP. Richard was scheduled to sign the contract for the new property on a Sunday, but that Sunday came and went. Richard and his lawyer sat down to discuss the state right. of things. Right, Judge, that it's all been resolved. So that we end up having uh, the problems that may have existed initially at the Kingwood facility all resolved and verified by that particular department. So that we've got a complete package of everything that we need to do. And that's the purpose of today's meeting, to organize all of that. Okay. 
couple of things have changed. Such as? Um, I did not sign the contract on the Strikers Farm. Okay, why? Um, two reasons. One, because Fish and Wildlife wasn't resolved. Okay. So there's no indication that I'm going to be allowed to stay in the state. Um, and the other was given within that context, I couldn't risk the money. Okay. So the other thing is so, that so I have now made, I have now, I have now made arrangements to move about 80% of the collection I've placed. I'm disbanding the collection. I'm ending the project. Really? Yeah. I just, it's, it's, um, it's too much and it's too long. Um, and this was kind of the last straw. I can't carry this anymore okay. on my shoulders. And this, this was just too much. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, frankly. It's too bad. It was, yeah, I mean, right. I think, um, I don't think we did anything that rose here to uh, yeah, these this are not, level. These are, yeah, I mean, these are not uh, criminal issues here. And unfortunately, yeah. what it boils down to is that, um, you know, you're dealing with uh, a group of people who are looking at their particular rules and regulations and that you violated them. So what I'm going to be asking that you do is just give me a, a narrative so that I can submit that with a cover letter outlining where we stand at this particular point, indicating as follows. The, the fact that you are going to be complying with the requirement that all of the animals will be removed from the state and the methodology that you're going to end up util, utilizing in order to accomplish that, namely the fact that you're going to be taking them out of state. Some of them are going to be in northern climates, some of them are going to be in southern climates. The constraints with regard to the southern climates that you've just given to me and why, therefore, you cannot be in a position to satisfy the
the only way any of us divest ourselves of these large collections is when something really catastrophic happens, when it's just not possible to go on anymore. I decided yesterday to place all the animals, and I started in the morning calling people and seeing who might be able to take them, and um, it's clear that I'll be able to put them into good situations. Um, so that kind of decided it, that the welfare of the animals is, um, was really, in terms of placing them, that was primary. Bill, Richard, hi. Um, mm, pretty blue. I'm, I mean, I'm out with the animals, which makes a difference. I'm thinking you should start thinking about how to get your place ready. Seabin Rocks, Parker Eye, the baby rhinoclemmies, I mean the baby um, Ramanai. And I would send those to you, because I'd just like you to have them. It makes me feel good. I was, there was one group I was, I mean, I, if I had, I don't even have a home, Bill. Um, so I wanted to keep this pigs high, but it would make me really happy if you had them. Um, I really appreciate that. What, what I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably draw up for people who I know less well or who are, I understand less well than you. Um, but I'll probably draw up, I mean, I'm going to draw up a breeding loan agreement. And I'm thinking of putting a clause in there that if um, an institute ever is formed, the animals would go there. So you could take a couple of groups. Tell me how many families. I have them by families. Just take a, you have a pencil? Just think about these. Um, I have three red foots and two yellow foots. Big adults and they're reproductive. And I also have some beautiful small ones, but they can't live forever in that rack system. Yeah. Yeah, and they're Great, and I love them. I was in some way wanted to prove that my having them to the people who were close to me had some value to it, and it wasn't just all based upon you know, emotional weakness and collecting mania and stuff, but that it would be the whole project to be converted into something of real value. And um, you know, everybody would like to see this institute happen, but it's like up to me to carry it. I can't do that anymore. Tell me if you want to break, Richard. No, I'm just sort of floating through. Like Kund and Ond, they'll be great at Sue. She'll take them. They're this big. You know, they'll live outside. They'll be great there. I can visit them. Um, they'll be happy. They'll be really happy.
this collection all around the country now. It's winter, we're gonna have to get a truck and fill it up and put heat, electric heaters inside and um, just warm the thing up and, and drive it. Specifically, I'm in a place called Sap Brothers, Pennsylvania, with a shredded tire on the trailer, emptying 150 turtles into a motel room for the night because nobody has a 15 inch hub to replace. So I guess I'm okay. <laughs> Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, get half of the endangered and critically endangered species in the world. You like these loose? No. Nope. Can't let them loose. They're, they're not native. They wouldn't survive here. There's no place for them to be let loose because they'd just be hunted up again. Um, four of these species don't exist in the wild anymore. So we're just trying to keep them alive for another 50 or 100 years mm -hmm. until something like that can happen. The world changes enough to let them loose. You know the chances of the world changing. Let's get animals inside. Okay. Where are we going? How many do you have? Well, I think we need to unload everything, yeah. then sort. Never ending bins. Oh, see, I vowed never to have turtles in my living room. There's human space and there's turtle space. Turtles in the bedroom, turtles it's in the living room, space. even <laughs> my other animals in the. I give up. All right, critters. Welcome to Michigan. <laughs> I think Richard got a lot of promises from other people that didn't pan out. And under his own wing, he should have kept his own collection within his means of handling. Um, yeah, it meant that animals would have, we'd have to pass animals by. And that's the hardest part, is learning to Put your hands over your eyes and say, I can't take these animals even though they need me. I'm tapped. You gotta know your own limitations. And that's the hardest part for a lot of people. I think that's the difference between success and failure, to be honest with you. Oh, look at you. Okay. I'm oh, a doll. That's the baby Mahoney. Oh wow, what a beautiful creature. Can you trip? <laughs> yeah, he's he's a real beauty. He's a great beauty. They're ballistic. They're great. You like it. Uh, they're hardy and they're great. Yeah, I don't think it's that. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That fact that you brought all the enclosures and yeah, build to set it up, yeah, that's that's the we'll set this thing up. You beat the cold weather. Take these two. It's snowing tonight. Yeah, that's what I heard. Enjoy. Garage material? Yeah. Oh, good. 
Well, we're working okay. it. This is a great pair, though. This is Kucha and Machka. <laughs> Dog and cat. This is my oldest pair. Aren't they magnificent? Yes, absolutely. I wish Laura was, was here to see them, actually. They're incredible. Yeah. OK. Where are your two Marissa? They are up here. Plenty deep. Keep an eye on him. Just a little bit. Oh, he looks happy already. He looks happy already. There's an evolution in one's own mind when you start taking care of animals. It's a, it's a humongous responsibility. I mean, there's a bunch, I, I'm not the only person who thinks they're Noah. There's a bunch of people out there that have, whether you want to say, heard some sort of a call or just followed some sort of quiet path. But all I can do is what I can do. Uh, and that's if that's take care of a handful of turtles the best I can for as long as I can, well, then that's what it is. If I get sick and have to pass them off to somebody else, hopefully there'll be somebody there uh, that can take them. Uh, and, and I'm sure there are. There, Those people are being born right now. There's people being raised right now. But we're not in, a, in an all-out run here to, to save these animals. This is, this is a crawl. You know, we're, we're on our hands and knees, taking our time very slowly to figure out what it is they need. We're down to the last handful of, of a few species here and um, but who's to say well, how it's going to all turn out right at this moment it, it seems like everything's just falling apart but I don't really think it is it's just changing for the positive um, it's this is not a failure it's uh, it's a change I think Richard uh, certainly from my perspective seemed to be uh, going at about a thousand miles an hour and it doesn't take a manic person. It takes a manic person to build an empire, uh, but it just takes, I think, an average person to, to do something like this. Right? There's not, uh, it doesn't take anybody special, you just have to care. I mean, like yesterday when we were sitting around together and building that stuff at Sharon's, it just felt like, God, if we were doing this together, it'd be so much more fun and so much easier than what was happening out in New Jersey with Laura and I just sort of hanging out there, blowing in the wind, trying to put together a whole freaking institute with fundraising and, you know, administration and boards and fish and wildlife, and it was deadly. And that yesterday was fun. We got the stuff built in a couple of hours, and the animals are happy, and if we could have pockets of that or somewhere around the country doing that and then maybe turn that into some sort of a non-profit umbrella where we could actually collect money for this so that we don't so that what happens when you can't take care of your animals anymore yeah. it's difficult to uh, to in, to be able to see the whole puzzle um, and how it'll it'll finally turn out um, if we keep the wheels rolling, something is going to happen one way or another. Um, I, I think you need to see what I have, um, what what my vision is, uh, to some degree, and if what I have is worth investing in too, you know, for your own your own sake. I mean, there might be somebody else that would be better. The animals are happy. That's what what I'm tracking is the animals that are here. The animals are at Sharon's. They're happy. It's like they could be happier if they had like 10 times more space and they're just going into another garage or basement right. or interior setting and that's sort of what the Institute was trying to move beyond into a much bigger environment. People, you know, it'd be nice to have one giant Institute that could take care of everything and yeah. it's called the world and it's not working. Um, so, you know, 
<laughs> you can't build a big enough greenhouse to house everything the way it should be. So maybe keeping fewer things in better conditions, get more space in smaller areas. Does that make any sense? You know, yeah. like what you're talking. One person has ten turtles instead of fifty or whatever. Because I, I'm going to do my thing anyway. Whether it's by myself or God knows it'd be nice to have some help. Um, it's not always easy to move, you know, <laughs> move mountains by yourself or tan turtle tanks or anything else. Um, it's as you well know, you, you've taken a much bigger leap than I ever have. Um, I suppose if I had had the, the funding, I probably would have done the same. And um, you know, I think we dream about the same things. Um, have a little and everybody's everybody's different you've, you've you've put more effort into it than most folks by a long shot if not everybody i mean i'm trying to think who else could i could even compare you to with your effort you know, nobody really um, it's uh it's it's, just, it's an interesting world i i feel like i'm standing at this pivot point between something right now it's a it's a change it, i'm witnessing something in you with you and and also something in me it, it's happening yeah. and yeah it's all right. and it and it's good for a change i, I like the good ones yeah. so again maybe it's supposed to happen this month <laughs> Everything was fine. They've always been on the light side. He's bleeding from his vent. Ooh. As of, as of two days ago. It's just, it was a question, will he fit in with your other group? Oh no, Becky's the same kind. I'll show you. Yeah, so this is gonna work? Yeah, it's gonna work. Let's see if I can pull. Great. My little group. Okay, let's put these guys in this one here. But I made I made this move then into here. The bigger thing. Just keep this one. Actually again I can split the birds and rip They're happy. At some point we're really gonna need a place or a couple of places which where these animals can go. Oh yeah, like oh you mean some place like a Texas or Arizona type I mean, thing? Some kind of an institute that's well not, yeah. Not because I mean, we're vulnerable as private collections. Well actually what's kind of funny is I always thought viewed the private collections as being less vulnerable than the zoos. You know, sort of, you know, it's, I, I am sort of against when people talk about putting 20 or 30 together. You know, I, I worry they'll have a cheetah complex thing come through where it's wonderful. You've got all the ones in the United States, and now you've lost all the ones in the United States because the yeah. same disease came through and wiped them all out. Yeah. Yeah, that's why zoos don't have more than one or two cheetahs. Because they're so similar that, you know, they, they worry about it. Right.
We went back to the warehouse in New Jersey and refilled the van with turtles. Then we headed down south. Certainly turtles seem to have some kind of special place in my life. <laughs> uh, but my whole life has been dedicated to them. Studying them, seeing them in the wild, photographing them in the wild. And uh, now we're to a point, we're at an age where it's necessary to keep these assurance colonies so we can have them around for future generations. And whether or not, you know, things will change in the future as far as human population and habitat and the health of our, the global ecosystem to where we can put these turtles back into the wild someday, you know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to tell, you know. We just have to see where things go in the world over the next 50, 100 years. In my opinion, I, I, you know, it's a double-edged sword for me when the habitat isn't there and an animal doesn't exist in the wild anymore and it's just gone and there's no habitat left for it is, you know, do we save it in captivity forever or just, you know, let it go extinct, you know? Extinction is part of life, there's no doubt about that, but Obviously, in this day and age, in the situation that we're in, it's one species, humans, that are um, accelerating the extinction process for a lot of these animals. Um, and because we have the ability to care about things and manipulate things, um, we can try to save them. I, I imagine that I would, at the beginning, would, and what I still would like would be to have a small amount of, of these creatures in my life because of the pleasure the involvement gives me and to be writing and have those two things in balance. And they seem to be very different kinds of activities. And the animals were not involved with history and not involved with society extremely personal and the writing was very involved with um, moving something out into society and into history and into verbal exchange um, and that balance was great for me personally I'd like to have that again So it's wonderful to be around them. You know. So how to have them in your life and keep your life at the same time.
if you're lucky a chance to be ground into the earth the wind playing with your sands before you leave this land impatience kills good chance Just might be immortal. It seems a long wait for treasures beyond the gate. And your looks and prizes aren't worth taking with you. The trouble. Together, Richard made 11 trips to drop off turtles. Then he gave away the rest of his tanks and equipment.
No money exchanged hands for anything. In five years, he had spent over half a million dollars. When we started filming, we imagined Richard's final reflections would be spoken at the site of his new institute. So, I mean, I'm trying to digest this cataclysm that I just went through, which is not just the animals, but 11 moves and no home for five years and not working and 52 years old and now gonna sit down and have, you know, have five to 10 years just to complete the project which I was working on five years ago and pick it up again. Do I have the strength and all that kind of thing? So, and so there's all this process, great. There's all this process in life, but on your grave, um, you know, process really doesn't matter, I think. Um, I mean, it, it matters in terms of one's lived life process. This is your life, great, this is your life. But if you're trying to do something and get something done, it's getting it done that matters. I mean, I don't sit around saying, okay, I really want to have a good process and I really want to have good intentions and have my life be about process and intentions. I'm sitting around saying, I want to get that done. I want to get that out there. Um, process doesn't help the turtles. They don't know. They, don't, they, know. they only know their circumstances. And survival of their genetic pools, process is irrelevant from it. That's all they know. They don't understand. It's like, you didn't clean the water. They're in shitty water. They don't care. It's because your mother died or whatever it is. They don't know that. It's a, they have clean water to drink or they don't have clean water to drink. Irrelevant. Anything else irrelevant, they don't get it. That's one of the things that's really great about them. And that's one of the things that's really terrifying about them. It's fucking what it is. You can't, you can't, um, you can't lie. You can't dissemble. Um, they get what they get. And there's no cheating. They just slip out of history. When they die, when an animal dies, when these turtles die, when you watch these incredibly beautiful turtles die and go, they just slip away. Not a word, not a record, not a trace, nothing. They just out of history, quietly. They're not even part of our history, you know, and they just, they just go. And it's heartbreaking. It's just, I mean, the way they die. It's so clean. Things change in many small ways. It emerges, it's unpredictable. Some species will survive, some species will go extinct. Which ones, who knows? Why? Well, you can guess what the reasons are, but where it'll come to pass, who knows? It's not about the people, it's about the turtles. It's not about the turtles, it's about the people. Um, conservation, it's about the people. No, it's about the animals and the trees. Um, and that, yeah, that shifting focus. I mean, I hope, I don't know, I'm just I hope this film isn't about me. Um, but I know in some ways it is and stuff. I mean, what, what really matters is if in some way, to the extent the film is about me or about the rest of the people who keep the animals, that can actually 
move something towards their welfare, the turtles and tortoises. That's, I mean, in this case, that's what matters. Otherwise, it's just some fluff, some biographical fluff. Um, I mean, it's some entertainment or it's some human interest story or some stuff like that. But, you know, the only difference, real difference here, would be if something happened towards their conservation. That's the only real difference. Um, and otherwise, it's just more of the same.